Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems. As usually, right, my favorite theorem. So take everything with a grain of salt and it's certainly a very biased choice anyway. Um, today I would like to tell you of one of my obsessions. So I really like the, uh, the mi mixtures between topology and algebra. And um, one of these really cute mixtures between topology and algebra is the study of so-called braid groups sometimes called Atim braid groups, um, because Atim in the 1920s was the first one who proved a certain theorem about them. That's what I'm going to tell you about. Um, and what makes him so really, really amazing is that they, they really lie in this intersection of topology and algebra, so geometry and um, some algebraic uh, datum. And it's surprisingly simple to describe them, and uh, but they still have a really rich structure. I will try to indicate the second. I hope to convince you about the first, so that they are simple. So let's just jump right into it. Um, so what is braid, right? I'm going to talk about Atim braid groups. So I basically should tell you what a braid is. I show you a better picture in a second, um, but this these are Gauss's handwritten notes. They're pretty old. 1820 roughly. It's hard to nail down how handwritten notes because, well, of course, he never wrote down a, a datum, but, uh, so a date. It might be the first appearance of braids in in mathematics, but of course, braids were around for for millennia before. Uh, if you want to convince yourself that braids are uh, uh, around for a long, long time, you just Google braids, and you will find none of the well, almost none of the stuff I'm going to explain uh, in this video. You will basically find whatever, um, knots coming up, sailors knots like like coming up in, um, yeah, knotting, <laughs> whatever. And um, but let's say bra braid, braiding hair, so braids and hairs, so hairstyles, but you won't find those things. You would need to Google something like braids and mass. Uh, but then, then, then it will be good because it's it's really one of the classical theories of mathematics. Anyway, so the first braid picture, this is this one here. I'm going to explain in a second what a braid picture is. Uh, is due to Gauss, I think, is due to Gauss. Again, this is really extremely hard to, to track down, but this looks like a really good number. So this is 100 years before Artin wrote down his Artin braid group. So I'm going to explain today. I'm not quite sure. What Gauss is doing here, by the way, is trying to um, to get some invariant of the braid. If you have any insights, just let me know. But I will link in this discussion in the description about uh, what Gauss was trying to do or what Gauss might have had in mind. He, he was Gauss, so he was ahead of his time anyway. So, but what is a braid? So a braid is basically exactly the, what Gauss drew here. So you have a certain number of strings at the top in Gauss's picture four, and you have a certain number of strings at the bottom, and you're allowed to connect them. But you should think of them as being in three space, so you allow uh, one of them passing over the other, something like this. I will show you a better picture in a, in, in a second. But, but basically, it's um, a braid, mathematically speaking, is a collection of points at the bottom, a collection of points at the top. And you should think of them as living in R3, uh, so lines in R3, and well, you just connect them in R3 without intersection. Connecting them in R3 without intersection means if, you, if I draw such a diagram, I would need to take care of which one crosses over and which one crosses under, right? I would have two, two different local pictures uh, depending on which one crosses over and which one crosses under. And um, yeah, so a braid is actually the three-dimensional object that I'm going to show you later animated. So it, it really is, if you want, you can you can think of it as having some kind of thickness to make it easier to, um, uh, well, to, to illustrate. So here I have my, whatever it is, uh, yellowish line, and it goes over, it's, it's this one, and draw a two-dimensional picture of it. And what do I do? I take my yellowish line, it goes all the way here. And this is really an object in 3D, and this is an object in 2D. 
I, in, in order to illustrate an object in 3D by drawing it on a paper, I, I kind of have to pay a price and I'm kind of losing information. And I'm trying to keep as many information as possible by kind of remembering which thread is before and which one is in the back, right? Which one is in the front, which one is in the back. Similarly, you have this uh, orange kind of strand going on right here. And it goes, for example, under um, the yellow strand, uh, but over this purple strand. And the purple strand is going all the way here. So what I do is, so all I've done here is I encoded this three-dimensional, uh, as three-dimensional information in two-dimensional picture by drawing the strings as like like a projection, right? You you take a you you, you take some light, you you uh, light the, the the knot, and you look at its shadow that it's that it, that you can see on on some kind of wall behind it. Uh, but that's not quite good enough because then you would lose too much information. I'm going to talk about that also in this video later. You additionally remember which was the first one, but it's essentially the right the right hand side is essentially a two dimensional picture of the of the left hand side. So whenever you do that, whenever you go from 3D to 2D or from whatever uh, 500D to 500. No, that's bad. 500D to 490D or to 2D from 500, that's a huge step. You will always lose information. And the Atin theorem tells you how much information is lost. It's a precise statement how much information is lost. And that's certainly different from what Gauss had in mind. Gauss was, was kind of, as I said, I'm not quite sure what he had in mind, but uh, well, there was a reason why Atin took another 100 years to write down the theorem. Anyway, so that's basically a mathematical break. It's you have strength at the bottom, you have strength at the top. Everything li lives in R3, right? So this is R3. And you connect them in any way in R3. They're not allowed to intersect, but they're kind of defined up to, up to isotopy, up to manipulation, like pulling or stretching or whatever. They're not allowed to intersect. Uh, so we also can't change over 200 cross. This is a really just something you can't do. And that's the whole point of a braid, right? If you, if you would not, not, uh, not your hair, you don't want to interchange over and under because then your hair would be over uh, immediately unknotted. That's something you don't want. Anyway, so let's address this question, how much information is lost. But before, let me tell you the connection to, to my shadow picture that I said before. But just looking at the shadow, right? We have, a, we have a light here, and here's my braid, and we look at the shadow. If you would just look at the shadow, what you would actually see is a symmetric group, because then you can't um, distinguish over and under anymore, and uh, you would draw pictures like this, right, where where you don't have an over and an under. Um, in contrast, for the braid group, you need to draw pictures like this. Okay. Maybe I was already running ahead of myself, but I just like the connection from break group to. So this is an information loss, right? So the, the, the symmetric group is an easy version of the break group. But I haven't told you actually why it is a group. And the group structure is pretty nice and pretty clear. And it's very easy to verify that this is a group structure. I just take two braids, like say this one here and this one here. And there's the same number of. Um, of, of, of points at the bottom and the top, so I can just st stack one on top of the other. And of course, I did it the wrong way around. So I should draw a red line here. So I stick this one underneath this one, and I get this picture, as you can see. I just have illustrated this red line here in the middle, right? So that's my red line here. Take two, two braids, and this is a picture from, let's say, four dots to four dots, and I have another picture from four dots to four dots. I just stack them one of them on top of the other, and I get another picture from four dots to four dots. Pretty clear. Um, and you can do the same for the symmetric group. It's, it's really the same information, but they're crucially different in the behavior. So first of all, the break groups are usually infinite, unless you have something like stupid, like just one strand, and then one strand can't not with itself. Well, at least not in, in this picture. Uh, but by the symmetric group is always finite. 
and kind of you can kind of see the difference here. So if you have a picture like this, and this blue, well, maybe I should do blue, and then this orange strand here goes underneath, underneath, and now it goes over, so it winds around the yellow strands, and you, you just can't pull it to the side. In the symmetric group where you don't see the difference, you can just pull it to the side. So in the symmetric group, for example, this would hold, and here it is just wrong. The break group knows more information than the symmetric group, it remembers more information. And then Ati theorem is a pretty surprising theorem in the sense that the brain break group in some sense is actually pretty harmless. It looks like it's super complicated, uh, Locally, it might be very easy and it's easy to understand. You just draw those, those nice pictures, so remember over and under, and you stack them together. But in the end, you're describing strings in three space. So why should this be in any way easy? And where is the information loss? And the Artin group, uh, the Artin theorem, so this is from roughly the 1920s, so 100 years after, after Gauss, is exactly this um, connection from topology, those braids in three space, so here's R3, to pure algebra, uh, namely the braid group. And how does, how does he does it? He says, okay, the braid group actually has generators. So everything is built out of those crossings. And with generators, I really mean now that you have an arbitrary number of strands to the left, uh, you put a crossing, you have an arbitrary number of strands to the right. And I told you that, that you can stack things together. So you can stack one of, another one of them on top, and then you can stack another one of them on top, and you can stack another one of them on top. You also have the inverse crossing because it's generated as a group. So there's also an inverse crossing, and you just compose them in, in any way you want. And every word in those generators will give you a break picture. So um, here, for example, I've, I, I, I can cut it in, that was a bad cut, I can cut it in several slices, and in each slice you see exactly one crossing. Yeah, so it is a concatenation of, of those crossings. And that's already a nice statement, so it's pretty easy, right? So locally it's pretty easy. And then Artin goes on and says, okay, the information loss is exactly encoded in these braid relations, so these are the so-called braid relations, namely, two of these two-dimensional diagrams represent the same braid if and only if they're related by those, by those two, well, two or three depends how you count, so we have three equality signs, maybe there's three equations, if and only if they're related by those three equations, which is a ridiculously surprising statement in my opinion, because we are talking about something in three space here and it could be completely cr crazily knotted and whatever, no, actually, everything is just determined um, by, by those two, two or three relations. In particular, one gets a completely algebraic way to study braids, right? And well, because the symmetric group is a quotient, you get something, a similar presentation for the symmetric group. But that's not the point today. Um, rather, I would like to stress again that it is a ridiculously simple, a surprisingly simple description of, of this three-dimensional geometric topology problem. Right, just a group given by generators and relations, by easy generators and easy relations. It's not quite as harmless as it looks because this operation can generate crossings if you go from here to here. So it might be that you need to make your break more complicated and then simplify it in order to see, for example, that it's trivial um, instead of just going in one direction. So it, it's not as easy as it looks like. But it's not as innocent as it looks like. But it, it's a really good statement and it, it, it really opened the door to study uh, knot theory. It was one of the cornerstones of modern knot theory. Um, so let me also finish now by explaining the connection to knot theory because it's also easy and beautiful. So whenever you have a braid, here's a braid, uh, you could close it. You could close it and closing just means you have your braid here and you just close all the strands and you have to make a decision. Let's say you close them to the right because you want to keep a two dimensional picture. And so each braid, each B defines you a link or a knot L by this closing procedure. I show you an animation in a second how that works, but um, 
basically that's a very easy idea, right? You, you take your diagram, it ends on a certain number of points. It starts with a certain number of points, it ends on the same number of points and just connect those points in a, in a planar way without creating any new intersections. So kind of the most naive way to connect them. So exactly like, like this. So here's my braid and I, I, I close it in the kind of obvious way. And the two major statements now, which say, oh yeah, we get a purely algebraic way to study nodes and links are the so-called Alexander theorem, linked in the description, and the so-called Markov theorem, linked in the description. And basically what they say is the following. The Alexander theorem says, this procedure is a good procedure in the sense that, yeah, every knot and every link arises as a closure of a braid. Which is not an obvious question, right? This is really an honest theorem. It's not obvious that everything arises in this way, but actually everything does. So that's that's already that that's actually a very nice step. Good to know. And the Markov theorem tells you kind of the missing piece of information in this game. Like um, you want to study knots, so you you know by Alexander's theorem that there is a braid. So maybe you want to study braids, but again there might be some kind of loss of information or thing going on or whatever. So you want to know what, what kind of operation on braids you need in order to kind of reflect what is going on for the knot. And the Markov theorem answers this question. So two closures are the same if and only if, so it represents the same knot, if and only if they're related by uh, one, two, three types of, of easy moves. One of them is um, this conjugation proof, which basically says if you have a braid diagram here, and you have a braid diagram here, I call it B and C, then you can exchange the two boxes, the two braid diagrams. Why? Well, secretly they live here on a circle closed up. And then you could just think of, well, I can pull my box C all the way around and it ends here. So I can, I can exchange uh, the order of the two. It's called the conjugation. Um, the other one is adding this crossing. And I leave it to you to think about why this is a natural operation. In other words, what I claim is that those, that those two relations hold is pretty easy to see. So those have to hold. The surprising about Markov theorem, the surprising fact is that you don't need anything else. That's it. Okay, sure, you, you need to have the braid operations from before, but we already know and like them, so those two. We already know and like them, so that's that's the price we are we want to pay. Um, oh, we need to pay anyway. Uh, but then you only need two more operations, and then you're done. Then you can study knots and links using pure algebra. You can formulate it in a in a way that a computer understands what you're asking. You can write a braid group in in terms of just symbols and the relations just in terms of symbols, and you can write the Alexander the Markov theorem model in terms of symbols. And then you can ask a computer, uh, are those two knots the same or not? And the computer might answer yes or no. Um, slight catch, if they are not the same, then the computer can't really answer yes or no, at least not in, in any naive way, because, because basically of this funny relation, and also you have this funny relation, which kind of adds something to the game. So you might make to make your knot or your diagram more complicated before you can simplify it. And there is no bound for how much more complicated you need to make it. So um, if the computer answers yes, then you're in good shape. Then the computer has found a sequence of those moves that transform one into the other. If the computer doesn't say anything, then you don't know. It could be that it just stopped because, well, runtime error or it could be that they are not equivalent. You don't know. So you need to work a little bit harder, but still the, the um, rate group theorem, that was this one, combined with Alexander and Markov theorem is a really, really powerful tool in uh, modern mathematics. And those two roughly came around the 1930s. And since then they have proven to be a really powerful tool to study knots and links. And, are still very much used today. So, so topologists really love them. And I love them as well. Otherwise, I wouldn't talk about them. Anyway, I promised you to show you a little bit of an animation. So let's go. So here we are, uh, a Mathematica demonstration project. 
linked below. It's a lot of fun to play around with it. So basically, um, so this is my knot, the one I showed you before. And it's really a three-dimensional object, right? It lives in three space. I can turn it around and you can see it lives in three space. They are really knotting. They're really going over and under. Okay, so what I can do here in the program now is I, I can choose um, different knots and links. So uh, for example, here's another braid. Oh, this is a really nice one. It looks a little bit like a DNA helix. Uh, it goes all the way over and under and over and under. And it has a certain number of, of um, listed braids. It takes a while to load. Come on. It takes a while to load. And here you go, another one. Very nice. And it's certainly a three-dimensional object. And what I just showed you is this two-dimensional picture. Let's go back to our um, lot number two. It takes a while to load. Uh, here you go. And this closing procedure in a slightly different, this program uses a slightly different way of illustrating it. But basically what's going on is I take those upper points and I take those lower points and I connect them. The, the program will connect them uh, into your screen. So into your screen all the way around, you will see it in a second. So I can do this here by curve the braid. Takes a while to load. Hmm. This is not what I expected. Maybe I curve it a bit more. Yes, so it curved the braid. It tried to connect the endpoints. Ah, it was just not loading, I see. Okay, it's a little bit slowish. It tries to connect the endpoints. As you can see, it turns it around. Now it would like to connect it. What's going on here? Ah, yeah, now it's connected. And this defines you as you can see, a knotted, uh, a knotted thing in three space. And I broke it up a little bit more. So this is the step before it closes, right? So before it closes, it's kind of just a, a strangely illustrated braid. Yeah, sorry that it loads so long, but anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a three dimensional picture. Maybe my computer is fast enough. But anyway, I think you get the point, right? You could close it up here. Never would pull this to one, it would be just closed. Yeah. Um, and this is now a really bad animation. It, it should it should be better in a second if, it, if it's loaded. Yes, much better. So now it's closed, as you can see. And this program actually tells you what kind of knot it is um, by just saying, I want to see the knot associated to it. And it's just now pulling it a little bit straight. Ah, it's this knot, and this is called the figure eight knot. Okay, let me show it to you again. It's a different knot. So let's go back to the braid picture and make it small. So the open braid, as I said, it takes a while to load. Now, this is the closed braid. And now we're going back to the open braid. Very good, here you go. Need to turn it around a little bit, whatever. Oh, here you go. And now let's take the next one maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay, this DNA-like thing. And let's see what the associated knot is by again, closing it around the, uh, closing it around the circle. Uh, and this is a knot you would get. Ah, that's a very nice one like this pentagon or not. And you could play around with this program a little bit. It's a lot of fun and uh, I like it a lot. So as I said, it's linked in the description. Okay, so up to the uh, program that is, as I said, linked in the description, which lo which is a bit slowish, but actually pretty nice. Um, that's it for today. And so what I told you today is, I told you about a nice interconnection between topology and algebra via the RT break group and the corresponding theorems, which gives you a purely algebraic way to study a topological problem. Something that is a priori hard um, and hard to think about, uh, easy to think about, but hard in, in, uh, in just a completely algebraic flavor. And yeah, that's why I like it so a lot. And there are many theorems of that kind, kind of inspired by this uh, Artin and uh, Alexander and Markov theorem in the sense that you always kind of want to translate topology into algebra. Um, but 
not today anymore. <laughs> so I, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.